All right. Well, members, the next item we've got on the agenda is the Department of Finance. Uh, is Commissioner France here? There he is. All right. And we have our state economist and uh, members. As I mentioned before, we're going to uh, start out looking at the budget forecast. If we uh, don't get done by noon, we'll be reconvening sometime after session. He came out. He came. No, he, he drove through Litchfield. Well, Commissioner Franz, uh, Director Kelly, Dr. Columbakidis, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, thank you. Who wants to go first? I'll start off if that's okay, Mr. Chair. All right, Commissioner Franz. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to make the presentation before the Ways and Means Committee today. The, um, uh, you can see people leaving. You can say Friday news is old news for some folks around here. But this is, a, this is an interesting February forecast, and we're happy to walk through it with you all and talk about the issues that, and underlining assumptions that are in there. I think you have in front of you the um, slide deck that uh, starts off with February 27, 2015. And what we'll do is we'll walk through the uh, slide deck and kind of go through the, uh, the information. But obviously, the, 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 big, the beginning news is that the forecast balance has increased by $832 million. And the available balance now for the, for the next biennium is $1.869 billion. So the, the slide labeled forecast summary gives you an overview of what we're going to cover today and how we're going to go through this process to give you the information and let you ask questions uh, as we get to the end. The main thing that I want to start with before I go through the, the budget numbers is that the long-term budget outlook in Minnesota remains strong. The story in Minnesota now is that we are seeing projected growth in revenues and reductions in projected spending. State economist Colin Bikidis will provide details about the improving U.S. economic outlook, and she will talk about the improved GDP projections that we have. And in particular, she'll talk about the effect of lower, lower oil prices and the value of the dollar on ex how it affects economic uh, changes coming forward. But if you go to the slide now that we have up, up in front of us, higher revenues, lower spending, I'd like to start with the current biennium and talk about the changes that happened for this biennium that we're currently in. So if you look at the, um, the change column, you can see that relative to the November forecast, so just from... From the November forecast, we see higher revenues and lower spending projections. <clears throat> so if you see the revenue line, it shows the projected revenues are now going to increase by $67 million. The spending line shows that the spending projections will decline by $39 million. So the combination of these forecast changes increased the ending balance by $105 million, or now $478 million. Many of you will recall that in November, we had an ending balance of $373 million after making the contribution to the, to the forecast of $183 million. Now the next slide shows what this means for the next biennium. So the improvement for the current biennium now added to the, the improved forecast shows us what's, what we project is going to happen in the November for the, uh, for the next biennium. So this slide shows the effect of, of, of a new beginning, of the former ending balance, now a new beginning balance for the current biennium increased by $478 million. But in addition, we see that we have a $616 million increase in projected revenues. <coughs> we have a projected decrease in spending of about $115 million from the November forecast. So these numbers are what add up to show that there's an $832 million increase in projected revenues for the next biennium showing us a balance of $1.869 billion. What I want to point out is the budget reserve line. So if you see the budget reserve line of $1.344 billion, this includes total cash reserves and the budget reserve. Sometimes we refer to it collectively as a rainy day fund. Now you all recall, or most of you will recall, that in 2014 we made two increases to the reserve, totaling $333 million. First, the budget that was enacted last year during the session increased the budget reserve by $150 million. 
And we also passed, the, this body also passed, the governor signed an automatic increase to the budget reserve that requires that a third of any budget balance in November be automatically added to the reserve. And that happened in November, and we added $133 million. So the two, $33 million were added to the reserve of $1.344 billion. Now, just to re re remind some of you, there is no automatic provision that operates in the February forecast. So any money that's allocated to the reserve would have to be done so uh, as part of a budget. So let me just make a couple quick uh, comments and I'll turn it over to uh, state economist Laura Kalamakitis. Now, you, as you know, six years ago, four years ago, and two years ago, we were in this exact same situation, but we were facing deficits. So we've been able to balance our budgets in a way that's eliminated some of the accounting shifts that we've had. We've been able to pay back the schools entirely. We've invested in education over the last few years, and we believe we've carefully managed the budget in part by increasing our reserves. We've tried to implement strong management ideas like uh, re, uh, <clears throat> renegotiating state contracts for health care and saving over a billion dollars in that case alone. But to put, a, put the sort of my take on this is that this Minnesota is a success story. We have a balanced and diverse economy. Professor Kalamakitis will describe in many ways how this balanced and diverse economy are playing an important role in what we're seeing happening here. We have the fifth lowest unemployment among the states in a growing economy. So now, collectively, we all face budget balances for the next two biennium. And so the governor will prepare a, uh, a supplemental budget and we'll present that later in uh, mid-March to this body and we'll start the, the conversation about what, what the final balance will be. But right now I'll turn it over to Professor Kalambakitis to talk about the state economy. Uh, before we go to Dr. Kalamakitas, I've got uh, Representative Albright and Waginius. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, on, uh, on the slide deck, and I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit, and, and, and Ms. when you take, take a look at the spending and, and you're generating a savings of $115 million, uh, can you attribute where that's coming from specifically from an agency or a budget? Is it due to, as uh, we've heard recently, you know, we've got a lessening in terms of the overall, overall cost for fuel and some other issues. Where, where is that number actually coming from? Commissioner Franz. Mr. Chair, Representative, well, Budget Director Kelly is going to, uh, has, does have a slide at the end to talk about that. If you could talk about it now if you prefer, or I think it might be actually helpful to hear Professor Klumbakitis first, but then we will end with a discussion of exactly those issues, if, that, if that's all right. Okay. Representative Wagenius. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, uh, Commissioner, uh, just to help us as we talk to our constituents, um, the number in the reserves looks big, but I don't have a context right now. Uh, what is the uh, portion relative to our uh, overall budget? Commissioner Franz. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I think one of the ways to look at the reserve is um, we have just recently put out a budget reserve report in January discussing the idea of what a budget reserve target ought to be. And so right now the current budget reserves equal about 3.4 percent of the state's annual revenues that are not dedicated. So non-dedicated annual revenues, about 3.4 percent of that equals $1.344 billion. Now, the, the budget reserve projections, or target, I should say, try to look at a number of things, and Professor Klumpakitis can talk more in detail about this, but it tries to look at the volatility of the revenue stream and, and the, the size of government. But it, in, in my terms, very roughly, we project a, we'd like to see a target of 5.1% of annual non-dedicated revenues, which would equal about $2 billion. Representative Wiginius. Perfect. Thanks. All right, uh, Dr. Kolombakidis, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, uh, members. Uh, so the, as, as you have heard already, the outlook for U.S. economic growth has improved since we last prepared a forecast last November. Since then, we've learned that the United States added 3 million jobs in the, la in the past year, the strongest growth since the late 1990s. The U.S. jobless rate has fallen to 5.7% in the meantime. The ability to find and retain good jobs, 
combined with, with improved household purchasing power, are improving consumer confidence. And that consumer confidence is buoying real consumer spending, which is the largest driver of the forecast change, the macroeconomic forecast change for 2015. The chart, uh, the bar chart in front of you, um, shows the forecast for U.S. real GDP growth by IHS Economics, the macroeconomic consulting firm um, that the state contracts with. Uh, and this chart shows that uh, um, IHS's February baseline forecast calls for annual real GDP growth to pick up from 2.3% in 2000, um, uh, I'm sorry, 2.3% in 2013 to 2.4% in 2014, the highest annual growth since 2010. IHS has slightly increased their overall growth expectations for 2014 to 19. The largest change, as you can see in the chart, occurs early in the forecast. So in addition to that 2014 change, there's an increase in 2015. Um, in 2015, uh, real GDP growth uh, has increased. The expectation for real GDP growth has increased from 2.6% last November to 3.0% in the February baseline. And IHS now expects 2.7% real GDP growth in 2016 and 2.8% 2 in 2017. So against this backdrop where we have uh, increased co consumer confidence, buoying consumer spending, and that buoying uh, real GD expectations for real GDP growth, two developments are shaping the U.S. economic outlook, sharply lower oil prices and the stronger U.S. dollar. Sluggish global demand and increased supply, some of which coming from our neighbor North Dakota, uh, have sent crude oil prices well below expectations. So the price of a barrel of Brent crude oil has fallen by almost a half since last June. Lower prices mean two things, at least. Uh, savings for gasoline consumers, and so those are direct savings for people who are buying gasoline directly, and then indirect savings um, through uh, purchasing products that use, use petroleum, petroleum as an input. But it also means reduced capital investment and drilling exploration by domestic energy producers. But because the United States is a net energy importer, the positive effects, benefits from lower oil prices are likely to outweigh the negative impacts. Meanwhile, the relative strength of the United States economy and the expectation of eventual increasing interest rates in the United States are attracting foreign investment and pushing up the value of the dollar. The trade-weighted dollar is up more than 17% against major, major trading partners since June. A stronger dollar reduces demand for U.S. exports by making American products, including Minnesota's products, more expensive overseas, and increases imports by lowering the cost of foreign goods for U.S. consumers and businesses, thus widening the trade balance. The IHS November outlook that informs our uh, revenue forecast depends on a number of things including, they expect, as we do, stronger labor market conditions translating into improvements in household formation, thus boosting the housing recovery, and labor force growth. They anticipate productivity growth rebounding to the long-term trend of 2% per year. They anticipate the Federal Reserve's actions moving from accommodative mon monetary policy to normalizing monetary policy to move smoothly. They expect federal fiscal policy not to detract from economic growth. And they expect international economic and political risk not to further slow uh, global growth. So moving to Minnesota's economy, the two developments that are affecting the United States economy, the strong dollar and low oil prices, will have an impact here too. A strong dollar will make Minnesota produced goods and commodities more expensive uh, in our trading partners. Uh, that will likely reduce demand for the state's products, including our ag agricultural products um, abroad. Regarding low oil prices, some Minnesota businesses have surely benefited from the uh, oil activity, oil and gas activity in North Dakota, but Minnesota itself is not an oil producing state. So um, instead, Minnesota's overall economic performance is a reflection of our fundamental economic assets, such as a large and, and diverse economic base, as Commissioner Franz talked about where we have uh, employment spread across a large number of uh, industrial sectors, an educated workforce, and a large metropolitan area. So while some firms are going to see some lost opportunities or some reduced opportunities in the Bakken region, uh, the net positive effects from uh, recent uh, reductions in crude oil prices, including those impacts on consumers, on gasoline consumers, uh, will likely outweigh the negative impacts in the energy sector for Minnesota. So Minnesota's economic expansion continues. Um, 
those economic fundamentals are responsible for, uh, for this uh, economic expansion. The chart you see uh, in front of you shows the headline unemployment rate, so that overall unemployment rate for the United States and for Minnesota. The vertical gray bars are the U.S. recession, so the white space between the vertical gray bars are the recovery and expansion periods. Minnesota's labor market firmed up considerably in 2014. The unemployment rate was at 3.6% in December. And that's a full two percentage points below the U.S. rate. It, and as Commissioner Fran said, it is the fifth lowest unemployment rate among states. And among large metropolitan areas, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area has the lowest jobless rate of 3.3%. And the unemployment rates have fallen in all of our regional centers over the last uh, 12 months, too. You can see from the chart, and I, I pointed this out on forecast day as well, that 3.6% lies between the low points of the previous economic expansions. So during the most recent economic expansion, the 2002 to 2007 expansion, our unemployment rate got down to 3.9%. We're now 0.3 percentage points below that. And in the longer expansion, uh, uh, prior, the prior one, um, we got as far as 2.5%. So in addition to the low headline unemployment rate, um, many of our leading labor market indicators remain strong for Minnesota. The number of Minnesotans filing new claims for unemployment benefits is back to levels not seen since the late 1990s. Other indicators such as average hours worked for private employers, temporary help employment, and job vacancies are all at levels consistent with affirming labor market. So the Minnesota forecast, as the U.S. forecast does, depends on these stronger labor market conditions, both boosting household formation and thus the housing recovery, um, and putting upward pressure on wages. Wage acceleration and increased job opportunities should draw more people into, uh, into the workforce. So moving on to talk a bit about uh, wage growth, the chart you see here is our uh, November forecast and our current forecast for Minnesota nominal wage and salary disbursements. So the bars, the height of the bars shows the percentage change in total wage and salary disbursements. So it's not average wages, it's total wage and salaries paid out. Um, and then the numbers atop are those percentage changes. Uh, Minnesota nominal wage income grew 3.1% in 2013. Information we now have from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, as well as information we observe from income tax withholding collections in Minnesota, suggests that wage growth rebounded to 4.3% in 2014, stronger than the 3.9% growth we expected in November. Wage income is now expected to accelerate to 5.4% in 2015 and 4.8% in 2016. And as you can see from the chart, we expected slower growth uh, in November, although we did anticipate an acceleration. It was at lower rates. Um, this wage income growth, especially the growth in 2015, together with increased forecast for capital gains income and consumer spending, we talked about consumer spending boosting the GDP um, forecast, uh, helped to improve the forecast for 16, 17 uh, tax revenues. Uh, before we go to that next uh, chart, excuse me, Dr. Sure. Kolomakitis, I'm getting a few questions here. I think I'll interrupt you and uh, ants, right. uh, get those asked. Uh, I've got Representative Hornstein, Albright, and Liebling. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Professor Kolomakitis. You had uh, talked extensively about the impact of oil prices on the overall economy and, and, and in developing this forecast. And um, I noticed yesterday that gas was now up to almost 250 a gallon and when when this forecast was made was were we in that time when it was in two dollars and under and now we're, we're looking at an upward trajectory I believe in in gas prices is that going to affect things very much uh, uh, and and was this forecast made with the lower much lower than we are current, currently experiencing today uh, prices at the pump uh, dr. Colin Bakitas. Uh representative uh, mr. chairman the I don't have in front of me, although I can I can find it the the actual forecasts um, that IHS had for retail gasoline. But what I can tell you is that um, they did anticipate the forecast the February outlook that we used um, had a, a barrel of Brent crude oil um, averaging fifty dollars per barrel through the year through the year 2015, and then it goes up. So it's definitely a temporary, in the forecast, it's a temporary reduction in oil and gasoline prices, and it comes back up toward the end of the year. Um, 
So the, the risk in the forecast is not so much that IHS was expecting low prices to stay low forever and we know they're not going to. It's more um, what, what's the difference between how, how that trajectory comes up and how quickly it comes up and what they had forecast. But uh, the, the, this forecast had, um, had Brent crude prices staying at, at averaging $50 a barrel this year. Representative Hornstein. Well, Mr. Chair, I think you know we're still relatively early in the year, so I mean I don't know if, again, if there's a, a way to revise at least the that piece, um, not not in the overall forecast, but to you know account for the fact that it is a unexpected and fairly dramatic increase. I think that we've experienced over these last few weeks. So. And I guess that to that question, Dr. Columbakitis, when is the cutoff? When you sort of stop taking in uh, new input for the forecast, I mean, I you know this last Friday they reported that GDP was at 2.2 percent instead of 2.6 percent for fourth quarter. You know, at, at what point? Obviously, there's got to be a cutoff. But at what point do you cut off sort of the new information and start processing the forecast? Um, Mr. Chairman, that's a good question. Uh, we. You attend our Council of Economic Advisors meeting, and so at that point, so we have two Council of Economic Advisors meetings, one um, maybe four weeks or five weeks before the forecast is released, and the one maybe three weeks before the forecast is released. And at that, at that second one, we present the February outlook for IHS. So at that point, we are we're having the Council of Economic Advisors review that outlook and let us know whether they think that this is uh, a reasonable forecast for us to use. And so we're using the macroeconomic data from the February outlook, if that's what the Council of Economic Advisors advises, which they did. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the GDP change that, that um, the revision that occurred on Friday, we couldn't possibly, of course, have incorporated that. Um, but we will, we'll, Use, use all the information we have um, at the time that we prepare the forecast. But I would say that a couple, couple few weeks before we release it, we can't really make major changes. Okay. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Professor, on the slide that we're looking at right now, it, it, it's, it's somewhat of an anomaly that we're seeing a 17% increase from the November forecast to the February forecast for wage growth, mm -hmm. um, startling to say the least. Um, it, in, in light of that, is it, what would you suggest that is attributable to either in small or large measure? Sure. Uh, Dr. Colin Bakitas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Albright, the, I attribute that that change in the forecast to changes in economic conditions and to the tightening of the labor market by a number of different indicators. In addition to observations at the end of 2014 that wage growth in 2014 was indeed higher than what we had anticipated in the November forecast. And so we are using information from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and observations that we make of the, uh, of withholding receipts from Minnesota taxpayers. And so we're using that to infer, to make inferences about what actual wage growth has been and what it's going to be. So the conditions have been primed or ripe for wage acceleration. Uh, and so it's not so much a surprise that wages are accelerating. What has been the surprise is that they hadn't accelerated up to this point. And that's been the conversation at the national level. It's not a Minnesota specific issue, it's, uh, it's at the national level as well. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Albright. Uh, Professor, and, and th that kind of constructs then, it, it, it seems like it's, it's, it's <coughs> a wage acceleration just for 2015, but then it seems like if that's the case, how do we respond then to the outlying years, 17, 16, 17, 18? Uh, is it just a one year anomaly or is it an expansion of wage pressures to mm -hmm. other areas of mm -hmm other sectors of the economy that are not going to catch up or what what's what's the devil in the details that's driving that specific anomaly and we're not seeing it in the out, out years. Dr. Colin Bakitas. Mr. Chairman, Representative, that's that's a great question. 
So the numbers that you're seeing are the annual growth rates in total wages and salaries that we are projecting for Minnesota. So we're getting this, this bump in 2015, uh, and that brings the base, so the total number of wages up. So we've got a 5.4% growth off of the previous base year, bring that up, and now we're starting at a higher level. And so you would expect the growth rates going forward to not be as high. So it's not at all as though we're saying wages are going to fall. We're saying that the growth rates are slower once we get this, this bump up. And um, you can think of that change uh, as, um, as sort of pent up, uh, pent up acceleration that we've been expecting and now we think we're gonna, now we think we're gonna see that happening. It's not about any particular sector. Uh, and I would, I would also add that the observations that we make from uh, withholding uh, receipts are, um, you know, are, are, it's, not, it's not as straightforward as you might think. We observe withholding receipts and we um, have to infer from that what wage growth is and we changed the withholding tables this year um, with the change in the standard deduction and so we're, uh, we're making inferences and calculations based off of that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And when I look at this chart, um, Dr. Columbakitis, I mean, this is not saying that everyone is expecting a 5.4% salary increase this year. This is this is saying that uh, partly due to the fact that we've got more people working, there's going to be 5.4% more compensation paid in the state this year, correct? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Okay. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had uh, questions going to this very same thing, and you've answered some of them, but I just want to understand the chart a little bit more because um, certainly, we're hearing a lot from employers that there are shortages of workers. They're having trouble recruiting people, including teachers. There are teacher shortages going on in a lot of places. And we're not really hearing, at least I'm not hearing a lot yet about wage increases. So I'm kind of, I was wondering if included in that figure, uh, obviously that's a, um, you know, a figure that's not broken out. You said this, it doesn't show you what sectors it's in. but. Does that number include increases in like CEO salaries too? So that if there, if a lot of that increase is going on at the top of the scale, which we know it has over, that we've seen those increases even during this, even during the recession, we saw still a lot of increases in the very top salaries, um, or at least the top compensation. So is that kind of all mashed in there too? So that maybe that part of it is even accelerating the most, and that the people who are making the middle class wages because I'm certainly not hearing that they're doing any better. So I'm just wondering why the disconnect there. Dr. Colin Bakitas. Mr. Chairman, representative members of the committee. Um, that's right. This chart is total wage and salary disbursements, which would include somebody working for minimum wage and includes the um, uh, bonuses and stock options that are paid in performance-based compensation to executives. This chart does not tell you anything about how those, uh, the increase in that we're forecasting in total wage and salary disbursements will be distributed either across sectors or across people of different income classes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Druskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh The term household formation, I don't know if I've heard that one before. Oh. Can you tell us what household formation, you said that it's boosting household formation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Colin Bakitas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, representative members of the committee. So when people during a recession uh, move in together to save money during a recession, so you, uh, so a student, for instance, who graduates from college says, I'm not going to get my own apartment, I'm going to live with mom and dad, or uh, two families live together, or I'm going to live, uh, a family takes in, takes in family members. So households tend to increase in size during the recession as people are trying to share expenses. Um, then when people separate from one another and start their own home, start their own household, that's called a household being formed. And so as the economy improves, households tend to be formed in greater rates. So it's the, the classic example is the, the student who stays with mom and dad, and then um, as the economy improves and, and that person gets a job, they move out and start their own household. Um, they might get married, they might, uh, they might buy a house, they might uh, live in an apartment. And so that, that household formations form an important part of demand for the housing stock. 
So as house, household formations have been slow, as the recovery has occurred, and we're, we're, we had evidence of, of quite slow household formation growth um, from 2013 to 2014, both nationally and in Minnesota, and we think that was some evidence of why the household, uh, that housing market was slower last year. Um, so we're, expe we're anticipating that improved conditions will improve household formation. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Um, one, uh, Thank you. Um, I have also a, a second question, if I could, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, doctor, the, um, the uh, uh, income tax uh, comprises a, a large part of the uh, revenue projections, both in the current biennium and in the next. Um, actually, in the current one, it accounts for uh, over 100 percent of it. Um, what percentage of uh, uh, the income tax is uh, represented in capital gains? Dr. Colin Bakitas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, what percent? Uh, the capital, okay, so the, you're, you're asking what percentage of income tax liability in a typical year represent, is, is made up of capital gains? Correct. As opposed to what's, what percentage of the change that we're talking about by any, by any I don't know what I'm asking, Doctor, but I'm, but I'm, I'm, but I'm. <laughs> Representative Mahoney, thank you. Well, we want you to answer the question anyway. <laughs> well, I'm just looking at this, Professor. Uh, you know, 90 million dollars on, under the income tax. Uh, what um, what fraction of that is due to the capital gains uh, projections um, increases? I think that is a good question, Doctor mm -hmm. Kalambikitis. Uh, I don't know if you know the an if you could maybe answer both uh, what the change is and what. Uh, what the total is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, let me first talk about typically what's going on with capital gains. So capital gains is one of the, is the most volatile part of our income tax. Very, that means it varies a lot from year to year. Um, and so the impact on the income tax varies a lot from year to year. And in, in years when uh, the value of assets go, are not, don't grow as much or go down, for instance, in a recession, then capital gains is going to have a negative impact. So we're going to have, we're going to have negative changes. Um, that said, um, we, for, we calculated that between um, 2002 and 2011, capital gains accounted for about 11 percent of individual income tax liability in the highest year and up to 3 percent in the lowest year. So it's quite, it's, it's quite a range and it varies from, from year to year. In terms of the changes now, I don't think I can put my finger on how much the current change we're talking about is due to capital gains at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe we can dig that out of the bigger report, uh, Professor, or if, if you could let us know, that'd be great. Mr. Rep Representative, Mr. Chairman, I can give that a shot. Thank you. Representative Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the professor, two questions. First of all, a, a big jump is in the income tax, and is there any data, I, looking through the report, I didn't really, wasn't able to tell, of, is there a distinction between how much of that is business passed through, like, for example, subchapter S, and how much is non-business? And then I've got a question, um, well, let's do that one first, and I have a follow-up. Dr. Colin Bakitas. Mr. Chairman, Representative, so in the next biennium, um, the individual income tax, as you've all observed, shows the largest dollar amount of the change from uh, forecast to forecast, $393 million above the prior estimates. And the responsibility for that change largely lies with higher forecast wage growth in 2015 and 16, and higher expected capital gains realizations in 2015. So. The 2015 wage and capital gains change affects fiscal year 16 largely, and the 2016 wage growth affects 2000, fiscal year 2017 largely. And so I would, I, I would attribute, I don't have a percentage to give you at the moment, but um, I, would, I would give the, the responsibility for this change to wage growth and capital gains growth rather than um, pass through growth from S-Corps and partnerships and small businesses. Okay. Thank Representative you. Davids. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then this is kind of, I, I just want to see if it's on your radar screen. There's been some talk recently about uh, a lawsuit uh, that the Department of Revenue is in. I think uh, Mr. Gilbert's the attorney through the Attorney General's Office 
where we possibly could have about a $700 million hole, and I know you can't project things that haven't happened yet, but I think there's probably a pretty good chance we could lose that. I guess my question is, or maybe just put on people's radar screen, because that, that won't be right away, mm -hmm. but if we lose that case, is there a plan B? Dr. Colin Bakitas. Mr. Chairman, Representative, as you've observed, we do a current law forecast. Mm -hmm. And so we do not speculate as to the outcomes of the political process or the, the um, court process, the judicial process. And so, um, so this forecast does not incorporate any potential outcome from that. Well, Representative Davis. Mr. Chairman, I understand that, but I guess my question is, is, uh, is there a plan B? Because if there's something that big hanging out there, and I know you can't forecast it now, uh, I understand that, but is there a plan B? Is there talk when the agency, uh, uh, as far as a what if, what if this happens? Commissioner Franz. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, there is a statute that provides when a, in a payout in a case like this happens, that it has to be uh, phased in over a number of years. I don't have the exact percentages or the amounts, but there's a limit in how much we pay out in, in any given year in statute already. Uh, now, this, this disclosure, as you mentioned, uh, was disclosed as part of the uh, bond uh, bond availability to show to disclose any uh, liabilities, potential liabilities. And so although you have made a comment about the potential outcome, I think that would be up to Mr. Gilbert and the Attorney General's office to make any particular comment about the legislation or litigation. Obviously, we don't make any projections one way or the other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner France, to that point, do we have an estimate on when final litigation would likely be done and we would know an answer? Mr. Chair, uh, members, I know that um, in my previous job that in, in working on this case a little bit, I think the, the it's anticipated that it could be not until next year, 2016, before any final determination would be uh, issued. And when you say, Commissioner Franz, any final determination, does that include an appeal? Mr. Chair, yes, it would to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Okay. All right. Thank you. Representative Mahoney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Professor, you may not be able to answer this one, so anyone at the table can. Uh, you use megadata for uh, wage increase, the increase of wages earned in the state. Um, you know, there's been a significant uh, focus on on, on the parts of the state in this legislative session. Uh, is there a place that we can find that kind of wage increase, you know, as a whole? So in, in the city of St. Paul, how much did those wages go up? Was it 4.5% uh, versus what the wages went up in Rochester or Wilmer or Thief River Falls or wherever. I mean, can we get that data someplace in the state here? You know? Um, uh, Dr. Colin Bakitas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative members, uh, our forecast is for the entire state. So, we, and we do not and cannot um, forecast for individual regions of the state or individual cities of the state. So anything that is forward looking on our part is for the state only and not, and not uh, identifiable for individual communities. All right. I uh, don't see any other questions, so let me. Oh, ah, Representative Dean. Sorry, I was. Uh, I thought you were going to uh, go through the. Are you going to be going through the rest of the? Yep, we're going to keep going back? then. Yeah, you, once you're done, we'll start going through the rest of her presentation. Do you think we're going to come back, or do you think we'll fall through? I think we're going to come back. Okay, then I'll wait. Okay, Dr. Colin Bakitas. Okay, so uh, with the questions, we've gone through almost everything that I had expected to say. Uh, so I will not add much more except to just uh, finish up by noting that um, as we typically move through a biennium and we see forecast uh, and after revised forecast for that biennium, we often talk about how far we are through that biennium and how much of the revenues that we expect to collect for that revenue for that biennium have already been collected in the sense of how much money is already in the bank. Um, so I just wanted to remind us that um, this forecast is for a biennium that has not yet begun. And so the 29 months remain until the end of this biennium and a lot will happen between now and then. 
And a good illustration, as we've already talked about, is uh, the macroeconomic developments that are uh, affecting today's economic landscape um, that were not anticipated as recently as last summer. With that, I'll pass it on to Budget Director Kelly. Director <laughs> Kelly, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you. I am going to speak to uh, the spending side of our story here. Spending estimates have been lowered in both the current biennium and the next biennium, 39 million in fiscal year 14-15 and 115 million in fiscal year 16-17. Uh, to Representative Albrecht's question, and I apologize he's not here to hear the answer, but this this spending change reflects uh, changes in what we call forecasted programs. So specifically general education and compensatory aid, the, the formula funding within the education area. Um, our forecasted programs like uh, medical assistance uh, in the healthcare area, our forecast for debt and our forecast for property tax aids and credits. So it's a limited amount of state government or of all of state government that is uh, forecasted programs and this changing these changes are assumed in those programs so in the education area we are lowering our estimates of spending slightly in fiscal years 14 15 and a little bit more in 16 17 109 million by fiscal years 16 17 and this is relative to our november forecast and it's primarily due to uh, downward revisions of three factors First, total pupil counts are still projected to grow year over year, but our growth is a little bit less than we had anticipated in November. And that's based on actual data coming from school districts now. A uh, second downward revision is in the area of compensatory aid, and this aid is based on the number of students who are living in poverty and the concentration of students in poverty in school districts. And so after many years of seeing increasing poverty concentration, the total counts reported by school districts to MDE this past December did not increase year over year. And as a result, we've reduced our forecast for growth in compensatory aid by about 49 million. So that accounts for almost half of this spending reduction here. And the third downward adjustment is in special education. We have a new formula enacted into law that is, begins in fiscal year 1617. And with this forecast, we have a more accurate assessment of total costs on, from school districts that is the basis of the formula. So we now, previously we had been forecasting what the basis would be, and now we have actual data to determine that. And as a result, we've lowered our reduction in spending for the 1617 biennium in special education. Uh, tax aids and credits is just a slight change over the November estimates in both biennia, and it's primarily due to lower participation in, in the homeowner property tax refund program. In the health and human services area, we typically see a much larger change in the February forecast. Much of our cost data was able to be included into the November forecast, so we're seeing a very small change here. An increase on the general fund by $25 million in the current biennium largely due to medical assistance payments for families with children coming in a little bit higher than we had thought. And an increase in spending in the next biennium of $14 million, and much of this change is due to more expensive services being used in the chemical dependency treatment area, part of our forecasted program. Uh, the last item of change here is debt service, and estimates have been lowered based on lower interest rate assumptions going forward, and so future bond sales will be a little less expensive. So overall, a small change on the spending side, and with that, I'll turn it back to the commissioner. Well, let me go over the last slide, then we can open it up for some more questions. Uh, this last slide is here, obviously, for planning estimates. This is the first time in this presentation that we talk about the fiscal year, uh, the biennium of 2018-2019. And we provide this to, to give some context to long-term long budget planning. As we've mentioned, the forecast is largely made up of future revenue projections and future spending estimates. But we must remember as we look forward, we do not have a budget enacted for this biennium or for the next. On this particular slide, we break down the forecast revenues on a fiscal year basis so that we can show you the structural balance that we are currently forecasting for each year, where, we, where you see more revenues than spending. Now, we know that the revenue forecasts include projected 
inflation in as part of the estimate. On the spending side, only some of the spending items contain inflation adjustments. And so the purpose of this slide is to provide some simple estimate of what the spending adjustment might be if we adjusted the entire spending element by a simple inflation adjustment. To actually go in and adjust all spending is more of a complex, complicated matter, but really here we just want to provide the context for you as policymakers to look at the future and see what effects inflation might have on the spending side. So the, the final analysis is we, we, have a, we have a larger balance for this biennium than we did in November. We have a larger projected balance for the next biennium, and we have an even larger projected <coughs> surplus or balance for the 2018-2019 biennium. So with that, we'll take more questions. Thank you. Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just had a, a couple and for the kind of, I'm sorry, please pronounce your name slowly for me because I don't <laughs> yet know how to say it correctly and I don't think most people do either. They just kind of say it really quickly. Dr. Colin Bukita. <laughs> <laughs> um, Representative Chairman, it's Laura. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Doctor, uh, that's my wife's name that? too, so I can get <laughs> that one that correctly. Right. You can. It, it's Columbokitas. Columbokitas. All right. Uh, I appreciate that. And I was uh, driving out in western Minnesota uh, this weekend, and the only uh, radio station I could pick up uh, had an economist uh, on it, National Economist. So, um, and uh, the. The, the gist of it was GDP growth nationally, uh, looking at GDP growth coming out of the last recession compared to previous recessions. And the interesting thing or the troubling thing, uh, according to The Economist, was that GDP growth was back to where it would have been or where it was, but it has not yet surpassed where it would have been had we had no recession, which is true going back to every single recession in the United States, even the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have just not been able to pick up GDP growth uh, to get where we need to be. And there's just this kind of, I think they described it as swimming through cotton kind of a mm -hmm. economy and trying to get back. Is that the same in Minnesota? And to what do economists attribute that? Well, no, no, I'm going to be sensitive about whether I'm pronouncing your name right. <laughs> Dr. Colombo Kitas. Good. Very nice. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Chairman, Representative, members of the committee, the, the U.S., the, this recovery has been a sluggish recovery. One of the elements that's national, that's Minnesota, too. Um, and one of the elements of, a, of the sluggish recovery has been this puzzle about why, wages, why wage growth hasn't picked up more than, than it has. Um, it is also the case that even prior to this recovery happening, um, we were observing that, or, or, for, or macroeconomic forecasters were forecasting that U.S. Real, annual real GDP growth going forward was going to be lower than what we had experienced prior to the Great Recession. So the 20-year average real GDP growth prior to the Great Recession was 3.1%. And so macroeconomists were thinking, well, we can, you know, we, we can probably expect 3.1, 3.2, 3.5, .3 up to four some years. Um, now the forecast going forward is, is, uh, is lower than that, um, so is 2.5% going forward. And part of that was because of demographic change, the aging of the baby boom and the impacts on labor markets of that. And part of it was also um, U.S. federal deficits and the, the disconnect between um, growth in federal revenues and growth in entitlement spending. Uh, Minnesota's uh, recovery and expansion has, was faster than the U.S. recovery and expansion. We reached pre-recession levels of employment 18 months faster than the United States did. Uh, and some states still aren't there. And so, uh, so we're, we're a little ahead of the game. Um, in terms of uh, why has growth been slower, part of it has been this uh, slower in this recovery than in previous recoveries. Um, some of the ideas have to do with, uh, with demographic change and the aging of the baby boom happening at the same time. Um, 
Some of it, some of the wage growth sluggishness has been attributable to uh, partly to that demographic change that you're replacing experienced high paid workers as they retire with younger workers that don't make as much money. And so that kind of puts a damper on uh, how fast wages can grow. Um, another, uh, another reason uh, has been that, uh, for instance, the housing recovery not happening as quickly as, um, as expected because the young people who become, came of age at the point where they would be buying houses um, during the recession, they came of age during the recession, the job market wasn't very good, that reduced their demand for housing and they have um, student loan debt to contend with. So those are some of the some of the reasons being cited for for sluggishness. But um, and we have had a slower housing recovery than um, than was expected, and we have we're only now seeing um, or forecasting the wage growth that we uh, had anticipated. So it's been true here too. Thank you. Okay, committee members, we're at at twelve o'clock, and I guess I'm a little bit conflicted as to. Uh, what to do here. I guess let me ask first, Commissioner Franz, I know that there's some other documentation that normally comes with the forecast. Uh, price of government, for example, uh, all funds uh, that we don't have yet. Would that uh, material, do you anticipate that being available next Monday in a week? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. The, I don't know about the all funds. The uh, price of government was really, was known <laughs> that night either. Uh, <clears throat> let me stand corrected here. All right. I'll, I'll let that Budget Director Kelly answer that question. Okay. Well, uh, I guess here here's the deal, folks. I guess uh, committee members, we I guess the DFL has this room at 5:30. I understand that uh, the Republicans have a caucus after session. I guess I don't know how long session's going to go. I know I've got a bunch of other questions I'd like to ask the commissioner, but I. I don't necessarily want to uh, bring everyone back here if no one else has got other questions. And we, I, I may just need to see how late we go on session today, too. But are there other members here who have questions that would like us to reconvene sometime after session or tonight? Or would people's preference be to wait till next week otherwise? I'm just asked, throwing it open to other members. Uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I assume you won't be uh, doing anything with the budget resolution for a while. I think you've got 25 days. Um, I know uh, both caucuses, it appears, uh, have conflicts uh, at some point after session. So if your agenda would work out, I would suggest perhaps next week. Okay. Yeah. No, I, uh, Representative Carlson, we don't have any questions. immediate plans to do anything on the budget resolution in the next week. We have. Yeah. 25 days, which would take us out to uh, Tuesday, March 24th. I guess I'm not a believer in leaving it to the last day, but I certainly don't anticipate anything immediate. Uh, so, but that's my point, Mr. Chairman, that I, I think if, if you concur, I mean, obviously you're the one that decides that, but uh, maybe next Monday our regular time, unless you've got a heavy agenda, would probably work for any questions I might have. Okay, and let, I guess members, let me see what other members of the committee have to say as I see them on the floor, and I guess I'll make an announcement on the floor. Commissioner Franz. I, uh, Mr. Chair, members, we anticipate that March, a week from this Friday, March 13th, would both the price of government and the all funds budget consolidated, consolidated would be available. So it wouldn't quite meet your next Monday session, um, but a, a week from this Friday, they'll both be available. And are you all available each of the next two Mondays at our regular Ways and Means meeting time? Not, not, the, not me, not I. Well, I guess, member, we'll let you get back to us on that. I guess, members, let me just, I'll make an announcement on the floor. I guess right now I'm probably leaning to not coming back after session, but I guess let me see what the demand is from other other members and we'll make a final announcement on the floor. Uh, with that, uh, um, what, uh, let's see, I'm going to, well, do I want to recess the meeting or do I want to adjourn the meeting? Okay, I'll recess the meeting uh, to the call of the chair.